Hey, welcome to my talk about piracy. So, let's get started. Can you all hear me? Is the microphone? Is it okay? Fine. So, my name is Martin. Uh, I'm a freelance Android developer from Konstanz, Germany. And um, yeah, everything you can find in the slides, every code, and everything you can find on my GitHub profile later. So let's get started with some statistics, uh, my experiences on piracy. Um, one of my very first apps that I have implemented was App Update Multiplier. Uh, back in the days when I developed it, there was not a Play Store, it was called Android Market. And yeah, the Android Market on the very early versions um, had one issue with update multiplier. So when an update that you uh, an app that you had installed got a new update, well, well today you simply see it in the in the um, uh, updates available part of the Play Store, and uh, if you have set the right setting, it automatically downloads the update, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it let in those days it didn't work really well, so sometimes you didn't get a notification at all that there is a new update for your app. So I thought we somehow it has to be improved. So there was an unofficial Android Market API. It was basically the one that the Android Market app used to reverse engineer. And you could check for app metadata on the Play Store. So I implemented App Update Notifier, which would uh, get a list of your installed apps and use that reverse engineered API to check if there is a new version available. And it would do that periodically. So it would generate notifications that tell you, hey, there is a new update. Um, it would even check uh, outside of the Play Store uh, on the Android market if there is an uh, update available for apps that you haven't installed via the Android market, but some, some third party market or whatever. So that was the app. Um, And um, at first, I had only a free version, which was app support. And I had integrated analytics in it to get some statistics, yeah, like I normally do. Um, then later on, when it was quite a success, I um, implemented a premium version. Uh, back in those days, there weren't any uh, in-app purchases available. So what you would normally did is you had two versions of the app in the Play Store. One was, was free with ads in it, and one was a paid one without ads and maybe some premium features or whatever. So yeah, I also added the, the premium version. But I didn't integrate analytics in it first, so I forgot. <laughs> so it was quite successful. It had some downloads and really good ratings and everything. And then after some time, I realized that I had forgotten analytics in it. So in an update, I added analytics. And what showed up is I had that many active users, and I had that many purchases in the Android market. So it was like 700 to 14,000, uh, which is quite a bit. So all of these here were pirated copies. <coughs> And it hasn't changed much since, so the, the, the values are mostly the same for, for current apps. You have a really uh, a high amount of, of pirated copies. They are a successful app that people really want to have. So, yeah. You really run into some problems when it comes to piracy when you are implementing your own app. So, <coughs> so first I will go <coughs> and show you some of the problems that piracy introduces. So, first, obviously you lose a lot of money because every pirated user gets your ad for free and doesn't pay a cent. So yeah, that's really an issue. Um, yeah, they can also crack in their purchases so you won't earn anything from in their purchases either. So, next problem. What do I mean by, by orphaned apps? Um, imagine you have an app in the Play Store <coughs> which works fine, 
um, then it gets pirated and gets distributed to third party marketplaces and everything. And then you realize that you have a major bug in it and you fix it, you publish the update on the Play Store, but yeah, what about the pirated copies? All of them stay with this bug version. Um, as long as it only affects them, that's okay, but when it comes to affect your, your server or your API or something, yeah, well, you have no control about those installations anymore. You can't publish updates or notify them unless you have implemented something old in your app. <coughs> Uh, about that bug or an available update, you have no chance of reaching them anymore. So, next point is app ID replacement. What does it mean? Um, as I said, an app, app update notifier, I had a free version with ads in it, and at some point you have to um, add the ad to your UI. So you do that by um, registering with an ad network. The most uh, common one is uh, AdMob. And they give you for your app an ID and you have to place that ID somewhere in your code. So that whenever a user clicks on a displayed ad, AdMob can map it to you and give you the money for it, for the click. So what an attacker might do is um, he just copies your app, reverse engineers it, and replaces that ID and redistributes the app. So when uh, a user now clicks on an app in the pirated version, it's not you who gets the money, but it's the pirate who gets the money because you replaced the app ID. And it's as easy as replacing a one string in your XML layout. It's really, really easy. So what's next? Uh, unknown modifications. Um, yeah, when you download an, a pirated APK from whatever third party marketplace or a friend that's sending you the APK or whatever, you have no idea what happens to the APK after it was downloaded and copied from the, the Play Store. So uh, a pirate can do whatever he wants. He can add uh, malware, he can uh, add any permissions that read your contacts or your SMS or whatever. Um, yeah, you have no idea what modifications were made to the original APK and it's really, really uh, dangerous for the users to download these copies. So, yeah, that's basically the malware problem. You can add it, you can add it in a way that um, the user of the pirated app will not notice anything. The app will behave just like normal, it will perform every action that you have do and in the normal app it will have, will have all the features. Maybe it doesn't even have the ad ID replaced or something, but in the background it might see your contacts or the email address of your contacts or whatever. So um, one of the problems that I had with App Update Notifier 2 is unpredicted traffic. Um, let's get back to my App Update Notifier example. Um, it worked in a way that it used the reverse engineered API, right? So, uh, but I didn't want to hammer the Android market servers and get banned maybe or something or blacklisted or whatever. So I implemented an own uh, cache proxy, whatever, on my own server. Um, it worked great. Um, um, but when you realize that I had like 10 or 20 times the amount of active users that I had uh, and users that purchased the app, um, it would create 20 times the traffic also. So in my example, it wasn't really bad because it was like 700 users to 14,000 users. But imagine you have a really huge app and um, network traffic on your server is really a, a high amount of your cost of your whole project. Then 20 times the amount that you expected or, or calculated for is really a problem. So it's best to be prepared for such a situation and be able to block pirated versions somehow on your on your cache proxy whatever or API server. So you have to somehow identify a pirated copy and just don't perform any network costly actions or whatever and just block the, the request. So uh, what 
can also happen if um, you have a perfectly fine app in the Play Store and a pirate comes, copies the app from the Play Store, does whatever modifications we just saw, like malware or LIE replacement or whatever, and this might introduce new bugs to it. Um, sometimes even the process of reverse engineering the APK and repackaging it might introduce some bugs. And the issue with this is um, that it can happen um, that a user downloads the pirated uh, version of your app and it has a bug in it. So w what will he do? Uh, most likely he will just Google for it uh, and will see the Play Store link and he will contact you via the support email that is in your Play Store this week. So he will not think, whoa, well, that, that bad pirate bugged my app and now it's not working anymore. He will think that it's your app that's not working. So you will be responsible for the bug. And of course, there will be just copied apps. And this is really easy to do. Um, you just, when you have a rooted phone, you can copy apps. But there is a, a licensed verification library from Google, uh, which will be in a later example, and then on the code examples, uh, which you can use to identify if the app is, was purchased by the Play Store or not. Next, there is reverse engineering. Uh, imagine you have a really, really awesome app idea, uh, which is built around some magic trick that you will do in your app, some magic algorithm that is really new and fancy, and it's built in your app. So anybody who downloads the app in the Play Store can simply reverse engineer the code, have a look at your algorithm, and knows what you're doing. So that's really a problem, and the only thing uh, that you can really do about it is that you will have to um, either encrypt Stuff, but you can't really encrypt code, you can only obfuscate it. Um, well, what you can do is ex um, extract your, your magic or your, your fancy algorithm to an API or to a server, so that your app only does um, an API request and the magic happens on your server, nobody can have a look at it, and it, the app just um, uses the response. Mm -hmm. So next there was in-app purchases at some point, which is awesome. But uh, imagine a user, uh, there is an in-app purchase for removing ads. So the user purchases that in-app purchase, and the ads are gone. But you as a developer, you have at some point, you need to store that the user has purchased that in-app purchase. So you can put in uh, shared preferences or an SQLite database or whatever but you have to store it somewhere. So what can an attacker do? He can simply uh, copy um, the SQLite database, for example, and redistribute it with, with the APK. So when a, uh, a user that wants a free copy of your app, he just installs the APK and the SQLite database, and he has unlocked the ad free version. So this was it for the problems. Um, next part of the talk is to show you how, how easy it is to actually do these kind of things that I just showed you. So we, we first have to have a look at the, the workflow of reverse engineering APKs and repackaging it. So how does, how does um, reverse engineering and repackaging work? You have to download an APK file, which is the app on your phone. Once you've got the APK file, you can just you maybe have to use some, uh, get some system resources also in order to fill some gaps. And then you have to decompile it. So once you decompile it, you have all the resources like images, XML, texts, IDs, everything, and you get code. And then you can edit all of this however you want. And the next step is when you're finished with whatever you want to do, you need to rebuild everything. And you get a new APK but it's not signed, and in order to install it without getting a, a warning and everything, you have to sign it with a, a certificate. So there's an easy tool for, for everything that's on the screen here, uh, it's APK tool. 
and it has two basic operations. It has decode and it has build, which is the reverse engineer decompile step and the repackage step. So what I did was I got the APK file from the device. I used the decompile step, which created an output folder. I copied it to a new folder called crack, made my modifications that I wanted to make, and I created the new, uh, I rebuilt the APK, which is the cracked APK, and then I had to align it and sign it. And then the, you have the new modified APK. So how does it fit? Um, oh, one more tool. Um, what you get is, you don't really get Java code right away. What you get is X code, because that's what the Java virtual machine, uh, the Android virtual machine understands. So there is a, a nice tool called dex to jar which just converts these DEX files to Java code, which you can read more easily. There is also a JDE GUI, um, which is an, an easy tool to just uh, open the uh, files from dex to jar and edit your Java code in a really nice way. There is also a, a, a fancy uh, IDE for everything that, uh, process called Virtual Sense Studio, which does all the, of the process in, in one big IDE. So how does it fit in our workflow? Um, first we have to download the APK, which we just use the Android debugging bridge for, easy. Just uh, ADB <coughs> shell onto your device, and go to the directory, copy the APK to the DSD card, and there you go. Or you can even directly use, use the copy command. Uh, the, the get the file if you already know the name and the path. So next you have to download some system resources, ADB, easy. And next there is the decompile step, here comes APK tool. And then you got your resources and your, your code. For the code you can use dex to jar to make it a little bit more pretty. And then you can use whatever text editor, image editor, IDEs, whatever you, you, you're using normally to, to make your modification. Once you're done, you have to repackage everything with APK tool again, and you get an unsigned and underlined APK. And with this APK, you can use the standard tools from the JDK that are used by Android Studio and everything also to sign your APK. But there, you can do it manually anytime. Okay, so this is the process on how to go from an Play Store APK, doing your modifications and getting a correct APK, which uh, people can install on their device. So let's see some examples. Uh, a simple copy. So when you want to copy an APK to another device, the other device, the other user doesn't want to install it via the Play Store. He wants to get it from you. It's really easy. You just ADB shell onto your device. But if it is rooted, uh, you can copy really everything, even paid apps. Uh, if it's not rooted, you cannot easily copy paid apps because they are in a secure folder. But if it's rooted, it's no problem. You just go to data app, uh, see the package name that the app has that you want to copy. In this case, it's my example from uh, which, uh, which I have already on my GitHub repository if you want to check it out later. And then you have the base APK, you copy it to the SD card, there you go. From the SD card you can go wherever you want, Dropbox, Torrent, third party marketplaces, copy it to another device, it's up to your imagination. So, as I said, you can even do that with databases, for example, if inner purchases are stored in databases or high scores or whatever. If you're rooted, you can copy everything. So, next example. What will you get if you use the, the reverse engineering tool, the APK tool? What will you see from the code? This is how it will look like. Uh, in my example uh, on GitHub, I have created a really, really simple app. It's just one activity with a button on it and the text field, and the button says check license, and the text field then displays premium version or free version. 
So I, I implemented a function called perform check for throw. And uh, in the free version, which you would be able to download from the Play Store for free, um, it simply returned false, which is a zero, for the zero. And this code that you uh, see here is called Smiley code. It's basically some kind of uh, Java assembler thing that the JVM can understand. And these, this is what you get before you apply uh, Dex to Java. To Jar will convert this to some Java code. But it's an easy example. You have just a, a function that checks for a premium version, which returns false. What you want to do is you want to return it true, of course, because you want to have the premium version. And you simply change the zero to a one, and you repackage everything, and there you go. You have tracked the app in a half an hour and APK, which will resolve to a premium version. As easy as that. The next uh, problem that we had was add ID replace. Replacement. Um, it's also really, really easy to do. On the top, you see um, an, a, an extraction of the output that APK um, tool will give you. Uh, for example, it uh, extracts the XML files of your UI, um, which are normally not as good as readable as it is here, because if you just extract it, it is some optimized XML. And yeah, they can put, refill the gaps and everything and the optimizations that end with it and give you a, a really nice looking um, Android UI XML. And you see I have a, a, an ad ad view here in it on the top of the, of the screen with an um, add a unit ID, of course. And what we want to replace is simply <laughs> that add unit ID, where is my add unit ID? You want to replace it with, um, with your, your pirate, you want to replace it with your add ID. That's all you have to do, then you repackage the app and you're gone. Okay, now the next interesting part is what can we do to fix these issues or to prevent them or to make it harder for people to crack our apps. So, first thing is ProGuard. There's also a commercial version of it, which is called TextGuard. It has some more features. But yeah, basically, that's what a pirate would react if he sees you are using ProGuard. <laughs> um, what does it do? What does ProGuard do? Um, from top to the bottom, I have the scale where it is uh, harder for the pirate to, to crack your app. <coughs> So the, the stuff you will get in the process, as we saw earlier, is you have <laughs> Java source files. Then there comes the Java compiler, which converts it to Java bytecode. And then there is the DEX <coughs> compiler, which converts it to Dalvik bytecode, which the Android virtual machine can read. So here is the point where this is the normal factor, um, where ProGuard jumps in. It uses the generated Java bytecode and applies some optimizations on it. So what does it do? The, the, the main point is it uh, obfuscates your code. Um, obfuscation means it, it renames variables, methods, classes, etc., etc. So that it's not as easy for an attacker to reverse engineer a code or to, 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 to get an idea of what each function does. This is what ProGuard does to the example project that we have. Um, I have a, a text field, of course, which I said, and I have the perform check for pro version uh, method, and what it does is simply replace all names with letters. So in this example, it's really easy to get the meaning of, of, of the method because there is only one method which returns a boolean and, and it is false, so most likely it is the one that checks for your premium status. But uh, imagine you have like a really huge project with hundreds of methods, and all of them are named A, 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 B, A, C, 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 and you have a really hard time to figure out which function does what. So uh, next thing is server side security. Um, as I said, yeah, simply. Um, Simply um, extract.
construct your, your magic logic and whatever to, to your server and not in your app. Because it's really easy to crack your app, but it's not that easy to crack your server. So, yeah. If you have a, a strong API security, it's really difficult to crack stuff. Obviously, uh, use HTTPS because otherwise, uh, with simple network sniffer, um, <coughs> people can just see what you are sending and receiving from your API in plain text, which is really interesting. So, what you can do is um, extract as much logic to your server and validate your users on the server. So, yeah, just make sure that he has an account, he's sending an account ID, verify that he is the user that he's claiming to be. And yeah, that's security that is on the side of your server and not on your app. So I mentioned the license verification library, which is a really cool thing and it's really easy to use. Um, here's an example of it. What you have is you, you simply initialize a license checker. It's a really small library from Google that you just add to your project. And you have to initialize the license checker and then you call check access. Those are all back. Um, what it does is it checks uh, if the app is installed via the Play Store or not. And yeah, you get a simple callback like hello, that yeah, you're fine. He has purchased the app. Do whatever you want or don't allow. Or if there was an error, of course, you get the error message. Really easy. Next, uh, and maybe the mm, most uh, powerful security measure is service managed accounts. Um, imagine you want to crack um, Netflix, for example. It's really uh, hard because you have to create an account and uh, a subscri subscription for them, um, and then you can watch the movies, of course. But now you want to crack it. So what do you do? You, you can only crack the app, right? So um, you might want to, to trace the requests they do and whatever, but at some point you have to issue a request for getting movie X, and they will check on the server side if you have a, a valid account, if your subscription includes that you can watch the movie, etc., etc. And if not, they will simply not deliver the movie to you. You can crack the app however you want. You are not going to get the movie. Of course, um, it, it's a different thing if you have a valid app and you stream the movie and it is cached on your device, you might be able to somehow grab the movie. But again, you haven't hacked Netflix because you can get all the movies for free for everybody or something because they will validate on the server that you have a valid account. Um, Internet purchases. I said internet purchases were really an issue because you have to store them somewhere and that storage can be copied to another device. Uh, well, not anymore, luckily for us. With the latest update, um, you don't have to store it anymore because the Play Store does it for you. Um, the new API uh, uses the communicates directly with the Play Store app on your device and the Play Store app does all the caching, offline access, verifying and everything. And you don't have to store that he has purchased the in-app purchase for removing your app because every time you just ask the Play Store again and even if you're offline you will get a cache response if he has purchased the in purchase or not. So you don't have to store it. And an attacker cannot copy anything because you are not storing anything, which is really good. Okay, um, I put some resources in the slides for you to check out if you want to check out the tools and everything. There is, of course, uh, dex to jar um, I will make the, the slides available later, so you can check it out easily. There's APK tool, and there is the official guide for manually signing your APKs with jar signer and the other tools. And there is, of course, the ProGuard website. There is also DexGuard, which is the, um, the, the premium version or the enterprise version of, of uh, ProGuard. It, it adds some features like it can encrypt your stream resources, which ProGuard 
cannot do. And there's JD GUI, there's Virtual Pen Studios, and of course there is my GitHub repository, where all of the code examples that you've seen in the slides will be available. Um, you can just check it out, compile it, run it on your device, you can apply the the APK tool on it, see, I, I think I have even, yeah, I have committed the uh, reverse engineered files also in the repository, you can directly check them out. And also the modifications that are made in the output crack folder and the, the repackaged stuff, it's all in there. Um, one last word, um, it's, it's, it's not really possible to to make an app not crackable, because if it's worth it, then a crackable an attacker will always be able to pirate your app. It's just uh, you have ways to make it more complicated for an attacker to get a cracked APK version of your app. So it uh, has to be a trade-off of amount of time he has to invest and how how much uh, your app is worth for him, how much he wants to crack it. So now we have time for questions. And also, if you want to give some feedback on the presentation or anything, just scan the code and, and there is a simple form. So, questions? Yes, please. And we talked about the giving API, um, yes. which um, talks to the, uh, to the Play Store app. Would you not just copy the Play Store app to, to another device and get all the in-app purchases? Okay, the question was if it's not uh, possible if the Play Store APK just uh, stores everything, just copy the Play Store APK and, and uh, all the Play Store data for it and get your end of purchases again. Well, um, you realize that by using the Play Store app, you have to be signed in with your Google account. So on another device, I, I don't know, maybe it might work if you are signed in with the same account on another device, but I might think that they also use some device hash or something to verify that you are not on another device. But in any case, if you copy it to a friend and he is logged in with another <laughs> user account, the, the fights will not work anymore. Play Store will realize that it's not from his account. Yeah. But good idea. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Uh, did you know the origin of Yes, uh, there were a, a percentage of, of China users, yes, um, but it was like uh, 20 or 25 percent. But like these people are not... Oh, I'm sorry, the question was um, uh, if, if I know where the pirated users <laughs> of my app are did notify a premium app were, were from, because in China, for example, you cannot get... Now you can, I think. Now you can. Uh, but back at the time, you weren't able... You didn't have the Android market, so you, you had to pirate apps to get them. But there's actually no lost revenue from that. Um, I mean, they couldn't. Yeah, but they wouldn't be able to purchase the app anyway, so there is no loss. But there is, for example, the additional traffic that will cost you money. Yeah. Okay. More questions? Yes. Uh, since uh, you mentioned the Google verification library, yeah. is it very easy to like remove it because it's a public? Yeah, so, so the question is uh, if you include the verification library from Google, if it's not really easy to remove it, and the answer is yeah. It's just one of one more of the hurdles that he has to, to do. He has to find, it, it gets obfuscated by two uh, programs, for example. So he has to find the point where you do the license checker and check access and everything. Um, as I said, you, you can make it more time consuming to crack your app. You can add more steps that an attacker has to do. And if it will take like, I don't know, 10 hours to crack your app, you might think, oh, it's, it's not worth it. So um, license, license verification is just an additional step. Yes. But you can reverse engineer it, comment out the license check, and there you go. Yeah. Okay, there was one more question. No, not anymore. <laughs> okay. Do you know how the license checker works? Um, it communicates with it, the question is uh, how the license checker works internally. Uh, I think it communicates also with the Play Store app, 
in the latest version. Earlier on, I think it communicated with Placer API. Um, you can also add some, some of your own server seed and, and hash security stuff and everything. Um, what it basically does, it basically does is it checks if you have really installed the app via the Play Store and if you have uh, a valid purchase receipt or something for that app. That's what it does. But you can simply comment it out. It's a problem. Uh, also, did you notice any difference between the player and the app or your app is higher? No. Okay, the question is if my uh, app became more popular after it got pirated. Um, no. No. I don't think it has Did you uh, any impact. Did you have more users or not? No. no. I don't think so. It, it, it was growing like normal. It was constantly growing, but uh, I didn't see any growth in the in the amount of users that were new or something. No. There was one more Thank you.